have the experts, the location, and the collaborative spirit needed to solve big problems. The challenges that we face are too big for any one organization. Through our collaboration with FIU on Global FinCrim, we were able to catalyze incredible conservation action in some of the world's most important groups. The Tropical Conservation Institute is an effort by FIU and partners to really work towards protecting the tropics at a very critical moment where species are being lost every day. We've intercepted about one million pangolins worth of scales. I can safely say we're not going to lose this animal. Water is critical to all life on Earth but it's one of our most imperiled natural resources. Knowing where your food comes from, how it's grown, I think that's really important. In pursuit of new antibiotics, we look at plants. We are the Global Center for Excellence in Tropical Conservation. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Todd Crow. I'm the executive director of the Institute of Environment at Florida International University. And we thank you so much for joining us this morning on our idea exchange hosted by Florida International University and our platform in Washington, DC for salient solutions, building resilient coastal communities, but in, in fact, building resilient communities in general. Uh, a few housekeeping things, uh, please turn off your camera and mute your microphone unless um, we have an open question period. Um, we do want your feedback continuously. Please, any questions, any uh, comments, observations, put them in the chat box. We will be um, reading those as we go through the day um, and, and basically reflecting on those. <clears throat> um, please be sure to, to tag at FIUDC and use hashtag FIUDC water. Um, as you're using social media. So on behalf of Florida International University and the Institute of Environment, um, as well as our partners, the American Institute of Biological Sciences, the Association of Ecosystem Research Centers, and the members of Florida Congressional Delega Delegation, we welcome you, we thank you for joining us, and we hope this morning will be an interactive and thought-provoking morning. We're gonna hear from a variety of perspectives. We have a great, uh, set of uh, expert panelists, um, but we want your input. Please, please, this is a very interactive forum and we're very interested in, in your observations and your input. This is a, we have an, it's an interesting time. You probably all know that in a couple of weeks, the White House is gonna pull together a National Leaders Climate Summit. So we decided to start that conversation now. And, and the information we talk about today, the information we gather, we will in fact collate and put together as a, as a synthesis and a summary and forward that information on. Um, so um, again, we, we wanna hear what your, what, what your thoughts are. Um, we're gonna, you'll hear from a great mix of panelists from across the country as we address the dual challenges of water quality and quantity but also the infrastructure that's required um, uh, for uh, uh, environmental and coastal resilience. We have colleagues from Minnesota who conduct research on the Great Lakes, colleagues from Georgia who, who work on infrastructure issues in the greater Atlanta area. Um, we'll hear from other folks on general coastal issues. And if there's time, I may reflect on some of the more pressing issues we have in South Florida. But there's you, there's also you. And so we have an assembled a, a, a good mix of stakeholders that are crit critical to our national goal. So who is here? Who has been invited? Who's attending? We have agency officials, folks from NSF, from NOAA, from other federal funding agencies. We have congressional staffers. We have national associations. We have re, uh, university researchers. And of course, we have our future, the students. There are lots and lots of students who are gonna be joining who are joining from many of the partnering institutions. So let's start with some quick visual intros. What we'd like to do is if you're logged in, please drop a line in the chat and tell us who you are and what organization you represent. 
And I'll give you a few seconds uh, to do that. So please provide some information in the chat box um, so we can sort of get a sense, everybody can get a sense of who you all are. Uh, while you're doing that, let me just mention that we are pleased to have Florida International University student fly-in cohort. There are 20 amazing students in the midst of a three-day seminar, um, which focuses on the future of environmental resilience for economic growth and national security. So fly-in students, please tell us um, your names, your, the year, and what you're studying. And thank you very much for joining us. So the, the, the things are coming in. We've got FEMA, we've got NOAA, we've got a lot of very interesting, a lot of great people. Good to see yeah, folks all over the place. So thank you all very much. We're excited to get started. So to kick things off, I'd like to introduce FIU's president, Mark D. Rosenberg, who understands these challenges. He's been in Florida for a long time, and he's been helping us lead uh, many of our regional initiatives. Dr. Rosenberg, I pass it to you for some introductory remarks. Dr. Crowell, thank you. And uh, in particular, thanks to everyone who's with us, uh, agency reps, uh, our congressional delegation. Uh, we're, we're, we're so grateful. And in particular, we're thrilled that uh, so many of our students can be engaged in this. FIU, we're a public research university, 58,000 students. This year we'll teach about 25,000 different uh, courses uh, with uh, 1,800 faculty and about 10,000 employees. We're a relatively new university. We just opened in the early 70s. We are very purpose-driven and, and mission-focused. Obviously water is critical for us. Obviously environmental issues are, are so important, so we're we're really pleased that you've uh, joined with us in this national conversation on uh, water quality, environmental resilience, and, and infrastructure. Uh, at FIU, we work with a sense of urgency. We understand that there's no time to waste when it comes to making our communities more resilient, that our country does need a national model for resilience planning, policy making, and crossing the policy science divide. And we need to find a way to foster public engagement, uh, more deep-rooted citizen science, and uh, problem solving uh, in, in our local communities. And so therefore, this consequential conversation is one of many that we are carrying out, trying to link our research to, to our words, our rhetoric, and our action. But we do have uh, uh, a lot of experience with this uh, in, in Florida. And we do know that, that resilience as an issue can be uh, a, a, a focus of bipartisan success. In Florida, for instance, uh, Everglades restoration, uh, mitigation for sea level rise, addressing harmful algal blooms. These aren't partisan uh, issues. In fact, all sides are coming together to take action on these threats. Our governor, our legislature, our congressional and our municipal leaders from both sides of the aisle are taking bold steps. We get it and we found a way uh, to work together. And I'm really proud that so many of our academicians among whom uh, you'll meet a few, you know Todd, uh, Richard Olson and there's so many others are engaged shoulder to shoulder trying to work through the, these difficult uh, challenges. Uh, upcoming national initiatives, as Todd has mentioned, gives us uh, all an opportunity to weigh in. Take, for example, President Biden's uh, release last week on the infrastructure proposal. Uh, Todd mentioned the upcoming White House Leaders Climate Summit. Uh, look, we got to get ahead of this. We got to be prepared, and we got to be ready to hit the ground running once these, uh, once in particular, the Climate Summit is over. Our presence in the nation's capital is longstanding. It's longstanding. And uh, while our home base is Miami, and uh, we see our community as an urban laboratory, but we also have a lot of pride in the fact that so many of our graduates uh, live and work uh, in Washington and are having their, playing their roles to have an impact on, on uh, national uh, and, and local issues. We, in particular, uh, in, in the 305, we're ground zero for sea level rise. You know that. Uh, we've got to find a way to protect 
our global treasures, uh, such as uh, the Biscayne Bay and, and the Everglades. They're right in our backyard, in our front yard, and, and our university is not going to turn uh, its back on uh, addressing these urgent local uh, environmental issues. Uh, in Washington, uh, we, we, we assert leadership uh, on a range of issues uh, in a collaborative fashion. And we, we take pride in being able to convene some of the best minds on, on the subject matters that fall uh, within our domains of interest. Many of you, in fact, are with us uh, today. The bottom line for us is that we are determined to find solutions for water quality and environmental resilience. We've been ranked number nine in the world for positive impact on life below water by the Times Higher Education University uh, rankings. We have a world famous wall of wind, which you're gonna learn about uh, later. And um, our success truthfully is, is not just possible because we have a very strong infrastructure, but most importantly, we have talent. We have talent at the student level. We have talent at the faculty level. We have talent at the professional level and in the community. And so therefore, um, we want to work with you. We want to partner with you. We want to find ways to solve problems more effectively, more quickly, using data, using science, and using the graces that, uh, that we've been given to help others. So I want to thank you uh, for joining us uh, today. I want to thank Todd and his entire team, Dean Mike Heidhouse, uh, for their leadership. And I'm really pleased that we can all be together. But it only matters if we can actually draw lessons and strength and get even more action as a consequence of our gathering. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, President Rosenberg. Inspirational words as always. Um, so from the very first hours of the Biden administration, it, it became clear that resilience was going to be a national focus, a huge priority. And lots of new initiatives have been launched. We're rejoining the Paris Agreement. We're gonna develop emission reductions. We're increasing resilience of federal facilities. We're, we're restoring our outdated infrastructure in the broadest sense, the physical, the cyber, and the human, human aspects of infrastructure. We're establishing uh, the White House Office of Domestic Climate Policy, the National Climate Task Force, a process for developing intelligent estimates on the security, and a new focus on environmental justice. And that's something that's particularly important, I think in many, many of our, of our coastal urban uh, environments. Um, and so that prompts us. Um, we have a series of poll questions that we're gonna be asking throughout the day. And so we'd like you again to please type your responses into the chat. Again, we will be collating all of these um, and summarizing them and, and then basically sending them out to all of you for, for further input, but we're also gonna be um, sending them forward. So the first question is, what one challenge and solution would you want to transmit to the White House Office of Domestic Climate Policy and leaders in Congress today as a priority? So please enter your chat. I'll give you a little, a few seconds. So pick a challenge and a solution. All right. Keep typing. Let me, let me set up while, while you're typing your answers. All right, I see some very interesting things coming through. A lot of infrastructure ideas. Great, 
So just keep, keep, keep putting your answers in. Again, these are very important to us and it will form sort of a synopsis document that will be interactive. We'll go back and forth to everybody who participated today. And ultimately, um, Carlos and his team from our DC office will, will get that forwarded to the appropriate stakeholders. So let's start um, our first panel. And what we wanna do on this one is really focus on water quality and quantity. Water, of course, is both an absolutely essential resource, but it's also it can be a stressor. Too much is bad, too little is bad. It has to be just right. Um, successful resilience strategies will need to address fresh water availability as well as water quality, flooding and storm surge, water infrastructure and management, and the role of local industries in supporting the blue economy. There's a new urge and push, I think, to sort of tie the environment more closely to the economy. And that's something we've been missing um, for a very long time. From a recent House hearing, it looks like it would take something like 171 years to bring the existing systems of uh, infrastructure up to state of good repair. And we're gonna talk about that and some of those challenging. Um, it's interesting to note that in uh, President Biden's infrastructure rollout last week, he singled out the Everglades and the Great Lakes. And we have folks who are gonna speak to, about both of those things today. Um, so with that introduction and, and, and keep, your, keep your answers coming, it looked great. You guys are putting in very thoughtful comments. Um, I'm really pleased to introduce our panelists today. We have Dr. Lucinda Johnson, who's the Associate Director and, and Water Team Lead of the Natural Resources, Natural Resources uh, Research Institute at the University of Minnesota. We have soon to be Dr. Matt Smith, um, who's a NOAA Sea Grant Canas Fellow. Uh, and uh, I, Todd Crow, you've already met me. Um, I will, if there's time, I'll talk a little bit about some of the uh, challenges we have in South Florida. So uh, the first question I'll ask the panelists today, highlight for us some of the major challenges and, and, and research objectives your organization is addressing, um, it, it, um, especially now and in light of the fact that we've got a president um, who's very focused on sort of water resources, infrastructure, and environmental resilience. And Lucinda, let me, let me pass it over to you to start. Certainly, thank you, Todd, and, and thank you for the invitation uh, to talk about these issues. Um, I speak not only from the perspective of a researcher in the Great Lakes, but also as a member of the Science Advisory Board for the International Joint Commission, which jointly manages the Great Lakes um, with Canada. Um, so for those of you that are not uh, familiar with the Great Lakes, um, it encompasses two uh, nations, the US and Canada, plus 120 uh, tribal nations, two Canadian provinces, eight states, and is home to 34 million people. The economy is the third largest in the world at $6 trillion. And the lakes themselves contain 21% of the world's supply of fresh water. This is an unbelievable um, resource. But as Todd has mentioned, um, these areas are experiencing huge challenges. Um, water level regimes are changing um, much more rapidly than in the past with, with record lows and high water levels occurring in rapid successions. Um, like other coastlines, we're experiencing increased frequency of large storms, water quality is being degraded and that contamination is leading to uh, societal unrest. And like other parts of the coastlines, um, there's been an uh, increased incidence of harmful algal blooms. And we all know that these stressors are unevenly distributed across communities in the basin. So environmental justice is um, very much evident in um, the distribution of these stressors. Next slide. So this is a map that depicts the cumulative stress across the Great Lakes Basin with the Lake Superior up at the top, uh, the least disturbed, whereas um, Lake Erie and Lake Ontario on the bottom right um, are the most disturbed, primarily as a result of agricultural activities. Next slide. 
As I mentioned, storms are um, a huge issue for coastlines and the city of Duluth experienced three um, 500 to 1000 year storms within the course of a year from 2017 uh, to 2018. And one of those storms uh, had estimated damages of, of $18 million. What this community ended up doing was essentially um, their, their shoreline infrastructure was destroyed and that was the source of a lot of tourism dollars. So instead of rebuilding their, their um, coastal infrastructure every time there was a storm, um, they decided that they would actually rebuild the coastal area uh, they reshaped the coastline in order to make it more resilient um, to these large storms. Next slide. High water levels are increasingly threatening um, the housing as well as communities. And many of the indigenous and um, low income communities um, live in these low lying areas um, that are highly impacted by these high water events such as are occurring right now. Um, the resiliency of these communities is diminished by the fact that these high water levels coincide with these increasing frequency and intensity of storm events. Next slide. Um, this just depicts um, a, a, a disturbing event that occurred as a result, a direct result of um, water quality degradation, which closed down the um, access to indigenous um, fishing in the coastal communities, um, border communities on, uh, between Quebec and the US. Uh, water quality degradation resulted in this um, community uprising um, known as the Oka Rebellion. Um, these kinds of events um, can be seen to be um, increasing in um, their frequency in the future. Next slide. And finally, uh, the uh, harmful algal blooms are uh, a huge problem as they are in Florida and other parts of, of coastlines. Uh, the city of Toledo had 400,000 of its citizens without water for five days uh, and cost the city of Toledo $65 million. Um, this event unfortunately was not unprecedented. A neighboring community of 2000 just the year before had experienced a similar problem to its drinking water supply. Next slide. So what do we do about it? Um, the International Joint Commission is in the process of uh, trying to develop a framework for an early warning system that would allow communities to identify threats and stressors, identify the level of risk associated with those stressors, and then uh, determine a communication plan for decision makers that determine um, whether they should take action or not relative to particular stressors. Um, this is one possible uh, way to increase the resiliency of both coastal and inland communities um, with respect to the kinds of threats and stressors um, that we are experiencing now and will be continuing to experience as climate change intensifies. Thanks very much, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Lucinda. I'm, I'm glad you brought up the harmful algal blooms. I'll never forget the sat satellite image last year that showed uh, the algal blooms from space in Lake Erie. So, I mean, the whole edge of the lake was bright red, and you could see it from every satellite image there was. So, yeah, fascinating. We'll come back to that. Uh, Matt. Um, what it, what is what is Noah doing? What are you doing as part of your fellowship? Um, give us give us some highlights of what you've been thinking about as some of the major challenges that we're facing and, and what you're trying to understand. Yes, thank you, um, and thank you too, Lucinda, for that wonderful first presentation. I think it's really great to see and to hear about some of the issues that the Great Lakes are facing. Um, I think it's 
in some ways different from what we experience in South Florida, but it's it's always important to hear about those experiences. Um, so as Todd mentioned before, I am currently working as a NOAA Sea Grant Canals Fellow, um, focused on marine policy, and I am I'm focused in a position uh, with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers at the Institute of Water Resources, um, as well as with a coastal ad advocacy group uh, called Coastal States Organization. And so um, I've been in Washington, D.C. for just a short period of time, um, since February. And in that short period of time, I've really been able to understand a bit more about the federal planning process relating to civil works um, and understanding priorities of risk reduction and resilience um, that may or may not connect across federal agencies and organizations. So I could provide a little bit of context to some of those issues. Um, so based on my time so far, I've, I've come across one overarching key principle, and that is really the need to understand, to forecast, and to communicate climate threats and how that is dependent on our resources and the knowledge that comes from working across local, regional, and national boundaries. Um, you know, this idea of shared experience is truly powerful, and we can learn a ton from the successes, but also from the failures of the past. And I think there are many great examples of effective coastal management um, in the New York City and the New Jersey region, um, following Hurricane Sandy in 2012, for example. Um, unfortunately, in many cases, we are still feeling some of those impacts years later. And so might attribute that to the problems of structural inequity. Um, hopefully that we'll be able to address uh, with this new infrastructure bill. Um, others might attribute it to lack of communication between uh, some of the resource heavy federal agencies. Um, but I think the biggest challenge is really for us as a collective community to think through the entire federal process of risk reduction and water resource management. Um, so thinking before the disaster occurs and identify priority research and development areas. So one of those research and development areas that I've been focused on primarily is, is all about natural infrastructure and incorporating nature-based features into a traditional civil works planning process and with a focus on coastal adaptation. So, of course, I'm sure you are all familiar with some of the many great examples of nature-based solution projects across the globe. Um, I think we have some of the most notable projects in South Florida um, that FAU has been a part of, um, so we're very proud to be part of some of those projects. Um, the planning process of the Army Corps is a bit different um, than some other organizations. Um, there is consideration of natural or nature-based features. So we're talking about wetlands, living shorelines, dune ecosystems. Um, we also consider non-structural interventions. So that might be updating policies, building codes, emergency response to early warning and evacuation plans. Um, and then of course, there's the structural interventions which are dealing with seawalls, um, breakwaters and, and such. So. Essentially, Army Corps likes to think about the range of possibilities, um, but as you can imagine, there are many barriers and challenges to actually designing and implementing something that's efficient and something that's sustainable. So, you know, we often think about the ridge, the green and the gray, as we call it. Um, and so either adapting existing structures, uh, we're restoring degraded ecosystems um, to their pre previous state, or we're creating an entirely new ecosystem, which is less common, but is also possible. So, you know, of course, there are many challenges and barriers, like I said before. Um, in many cases, it's always, in, well, I want to say always, but it's cheaper to create a levy than it is to potentially restore an ecosystem that might provide another full range of benefits, and benefits that could benefit uh, the mitigation of water quality uh, to reduce flood impact and exposure. Um, and so it's really just rethinking the structure and the foundation upon which those decisions are made. So, you know, in the case of natural infrastructure projects, um, those that are a true blend of the green and the gray, it's unfortunate, but a lot of those projects don't ever get off the ground because there's no efficient or effective way of assessing performance or quantifying ecosystem benefits. 
at a large scale. And so, you know, for example, if a project has been identified as a coastal shoreline reconstruction um, that incorporates some hard elements and the soft green elements, um, but it does not have a designation of being an ecosystem restoration project, it is almost impossible for us as evaluators and facilitators to quantify and to assess the full range of ecological benefits. So I think, you know, we're limited from the start in those cases by not having the correct language in place um, and providing the, the framework to assess what could be. Um, so, you know, I give the example within the Army Corps, we work within uh, what are called habitat units. And essentially it's a measure of scale, most often an acre. Um, and you're representing a level of habitat quality, anywhere from zero to one, your zero might be representing um, a paved parking lot and a very high habitat quality might be your most pristine wetland ecosystem. So of course, there's a range of different ecosystem and habitats within that zero to one scale. Um, but we can think about ways to update that process. Think about ways that we restructure the language around that. And how can we quantify benefits in different ways that might not mean reallocating costs and funds, um, but might just be a, a restructuring of thinking. Great, thanks a lot, Matt. Um, you, early on, you, you, you used the term communication education. I've been watching the chats and what people think some of the major challenges are. And, and a lot of people were sort of highlighting the, you know, the, the need for inclusivity, the need for better communication. I know Lucinda and I have spent lots of time discussing one of the National Science Foundation new uh, sort of programs called Coastlines and People. And, and that, that new program is all about sort of at the beginning being inclusive, bringing the communities on board and having them be part of the question uh, asking, the, the hypothesis uh, driving um, and sort of getting community buy-in from the get-go instead of just scientists saying, this is what we know and passing it on. Let me just say a few things uh, more um, from the South Florida perspective, just like the Great Lakes were called out by President Biden as a crucial area um, so too was the Everglades. And so um, besides just needing to restore the Everglades because they are one of the world's iconic wetlands and, and should in fact be, be restored for their ecosystem function, their beauty and their cultural importance to the Miccosukee tribe of Indians among others. There's also a, a problem that we have in South Florida associated with Everglades restoration, I think a lot of people don't understand. And so we've got the Everglades over to the West, and then we've got um, the Biscayne Bay to the East, and right along the edge of the Eastern shore of, of South Florida is the Biscayne Aquifer. And that's where we get most of our drinking water, almost all of our drinking water, in fact, comes from that aquifer. So what we've got is a sort of a pressure problem. So we have drained the Everglades to about a, a little over, I guess, a half of its uh, historic volume. And at the same time, sea level is rising um, on the East Coast. <clears throat> and the problem is Florida is built on a calcareous, very porous limestone medium. So what that means is as the pressure associated with sea level rise, the salt water gets higher and our fresh water is lower, the salt water is starting to push through our porous um, bedrock, both from the sides and from under, and it's starting to infiltrate into our fresh water. So we're getting um, measurable salt water intrusion into the one and only groundwater source we have for all of our drinking water, all of our fresh water. So we've got a serious issue and an immediate need to restore the Everglades with clean, fresh water so that we can use the fresh water to push back against the salt water so we can protect our drinking water. And that's a linkage between the West and the East that many people aren't thinking about. So that's one very immediate challenge we have to get the Everglades put back together. The other immediate challenge from water quality perspective is that Miami and the greater Miami area has just completely outgrown the infrastructure that was originally put into place. We still have millions of homes that are on septic systems. 
And if you think about that, our groundwater table is so high, again, because of that calcareous porous um, bedrock material we're sitting on, that if you have a septic system sitting in the ground and you get a heavy rainfall event, all the stuff that's in that septic system is going to rise up and get into our groundwater, run off into the streets, get into the storm drains, and basically everything ends up in, in Biscayne Bay. And, and while you all have watched the news and, and you might think that South Florida is just a party haven, in fact, the majority of our economic drivers are things like recreation, fisheries, um, not just spring breakers. And so, you know, the loss of water quality, the loss of seagrass habitat, the loss of coral reefs, and, you know, potentially the ultimate collapse of our fisheries is a huge threat to us um, in South Florida from an economic perspective. So cleaning up the drinking water, uh, or sorry, cleaning up our water, our septic systems, restoring that infrastructure to minimize the amount of phosphorus and nitrogen that's going from our sewer systems into the bay is absolutely critical. It's expensive, it's gonna be hard, but we really, really don't have an option. In August, we had a, a, a major fish kill in Biscayne Bay the bay basically went anoxic for a couple of days. And you know we almost lost that entire ecosystem. So it's timing now is super essential for us, get the Everglades uh, restored and get our, our, uh, our water infrastructure put into place. And of course, in the news lately, I can't help to mention, this isn't South Florida, but up in Tampa, you know, there was an old phosphate plant and they built these retention ponds. And so all of the, the wastewater from, from the processing plant is being held in these huge reservoirs. And there was, of course, there was a breach in one of those reservoirs. So literally metric tons of phosphate is being pumped from that reservoir into Tampa Bay to basically stop the potential for flooding and, and, and loss of uh, life and uh, property. Um, so far, it looks like they got it kind of contained, but what they're doing right now is pumping that water directly into Tampa Bay. What is so sad about that is Tampa Bay is one of the success stories, sort of like the Hudson River story, um, where they found a problem. There was a nitrogen pollution problem in Tampa Bay. They identified many of the sources. They remediated many of those sources. They put in... Uh, wetlands to take up some of the nitrogen, and they have made significant process in cleaning up Tampa Bay. It's gotten better and better. But now, of course, phosphate or phosphorus, that other major pollutant that results in eutrophication of our waters, um, is now being pumped directly into Tampa Bay. This was a foreseeable problem. It was, it's an infrastructure problem. There had always been a plan to drill a, a, a 200 meter or so um, well down and basically inject some of that water down into deep ground water well, and it never happened. And so now everybody's scrambling, looking for $200 million to drill this deep well so that they can start injecting this phosphorus down there. I also wonder about that because again, porous medium and where will all that phosphate and, and, and phosphorus laden water go even as, as it's injected into a deep well. So we have serious problems ourselves uh, throughout Florida, um, akin to the things that Lucinda talked about and, and Matt. So let me, let me go back, Matt, now to you, a second question. So, it, you know, this is a, a great time. We've got uh, an administration that's focused on environmental resilience. They understand the limitations to our infrastructure. They're putting together all of these groups that are associated with climate. Um, what, what, one thing, one solution, one target, if you get to set the president's agenda for what are we going to do in the next year, what, what, would, you, what would you tell us? And uh, Matt, let me start with you and then I'll go to Lucinda. Great, thanks, Todd. Uh, that's a great question. Something that I've really been trying to focus on uh, recently over the past couple of weeks. So I think looking back to the first panel question where I raised some of the issues surrounding the need to connect people and resources across these different boundaries. Um, I think in order to do that effectively, there needs to be increased funding and resource allocation to uh, the NOAA Office of Coastal Management programs. Um, so those are funded in part under the Coastal Zone Management Act or CZMA. 
Um, and those are in conjunction with other cooperative agreements, such as our National Estuarine Research Reserve Systems, or NEARS. Um, and so it's programs like that that are really primed and ready to take action on resiliency. So they are the ones who are doing the critical thinking. They can be the ones who are doing the on the ground work in partnership with other federal agencies. And so I think increasing funding um, and other resources um, to those programs would really help us to move the needle forward on resiliency. I think um, in general, those programs are really composed of interdisciplinary scholars um, at the state level. And then those folks can act as the enablers to connect those different pieces of research and practice to management. Um, and you know, they also have the ability to manage projects on the ground level um, while remaining focused on some of these longer term in our regional planning goals um, that might be further out on the horizon, but are still important to our larger objectives. Um, and then also, I think in regard to some of the focus around natural infrastructure, nature-based solutions, um, kind of moving away from just the traditional hard gray infrastructure. Um, I think there's a lot that we can do to also modify the language that surrounds coastal resilience, um, to rethink those issues. Um, and as a collective coastal community, that I'll call it, uh, we can provide comment to pieces of legislation that are raised to Congress. And it's often through Congress that we're able to get a lot of a lot of things done. And I think this is the time to do that effectively and efficiently. Um, I think specifically, you know, we can provide clear and effective language through comments um, and public forums um, that address the need for evaluating and implementing nature-based solutions. I give the example of the Water Resource Development Act or WERDA um, because they have held a number of public comment periods um, either within the federal sphere or um, beyond. And that's been really helpful because those comments are directly influencing what Congress is looking at and how they're um, allocating some of these resources. So Great. I don't think it's any uh, question that we have come to realize the full potential of nature-based solutions. Um, and I think it's, we need to be able to put that in writing to make sure that they're at least considered in the federal planning process um, when it comes to dealing with risk management and coastal adaptation. Right. Yeah, so interesting. I think it was about four years ago that I was speaking before a bipartisan group of Congress people trying to defend uh, the near sites and sea grant from the budgetary chopping block, which thankfully we did save. Lucinda, back to you. I mean, you you just have the small problem of trying to preserve, you know, the majority of the nation's freshwater resources in the Great Lakes. Um, what, what do you got to what do you got to get across to Congress? What do they got to get done now? Well, communities are starved for information about both the um, known threats, the, the threats that are uh, anticipated or suspected, and um, those threats that we don't really have a full understanding of, the, the unknown, unknown threats of, of Donald Rumsfeld, um, so to speak. So my... Uh, uh, in conversations across the Great Lakes Basin, um, communities are really interested in understanding um, the level of the, the types of, of threats and stressors, um, but also the, the direct risk that their communities pose um, as a result of those threats and stressors. Um, where do we get information? We get information from existing monitoring programs, um, from satellite data collection uh, programs. Uh, this mass of data and information though um, need to be assembled in a way to um, take advantage of scenarios and models and, and tools that help communities predict and then prioritize how to use their scarce resources. So uh, one of the recommendations I would be inclined to make is um, for us to continue to support existing monitoring programs. We need long-term data in order to understand the potential uh, uh, level of threat and the, the behavior of those threats. Um, things like changing variance patterns in long-term data sets are a very good example of a, an early warning um, system indicator. 
so keeping in mind that data and information um, need to have some sort of an organization and a mechanism for um, delivering that information. Um, that's where some of the um, organizations and infrastructure that Matt was discussing um, come in because data and information are not usable until they are in a form that can be um, used by the decision makers and managers who need to be responding to those threats and stressors. Great. Yeah, I've got yeah, the nonlinearity of aquatic systems has always been a, a, a perplexing issue. All right, let's let's open it up. Um, we've got these great panelists. Um, let me open it up to uh, attendees. It looks like there's 75 or 76 folks. Um, I'm just seeing, 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 what do I got here? Uh, let's see. Do I have Krista? It looks like um, Krista. I think you're a Kristen. FIE. Yeah, Kristen. Sorry. <laughs> uh, you have a question, I guess. But but I think you're one of the FIU flying students, right? Can you just I am. In a very short amount of time tell us a little bit about what you're doing up there? Um, well, we're we're here. We're remote, but we're talking to all kinds of. Um, you know, uh, people involved in policymaking and um, uh, it just all those different players involved. Um, and our theme is um, environmental resilience and the uh, economy um, and and national security sort of intersecting those goals and, and how they intersect um, just through various strategies and all that. So that's kind of a very broad overview. Um, uh, yeah, and, and we've been talking to all kinds of people from from different organizations and it's been very insightful. Um, so I have a question for, for you guys, um, and uh, I guess it could be kind of directed to anybody, maybe maybe more for Matt, but um, also Lucinda could, could definitely um, uh, add to it. So I'm curious, um, considering the urgency of all the you know, environmental issues facing our, coast, our coastal communities and the large scale and cost of changing infrastructure and you know, the kind of time delay that that would involve, um, it seems important to sort of triage our strategies um, and look for um, maybe minimum input to maximum output. So I'm curious if you agree with this sort of triage approach and what strategies or policy approaches you would suggest would sort of have that maximum positive impact for minimum lowest cost. Well, okay, Matt, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> and that's maybe a tough question, but... <laughs> No, thank you so much. Thanks, Kristen. That's a that's a really great question. I think something that we at the Army Corps are really trying to focus our efforts on because we realize in order to move forward, we have to figure out solutions or strategies that, um, like you said, are are low low effort but result in maximum impact. Um, I think, and coming back to what Lucinda was bringing up earlier, just about creating platforms and areas for information exchange and knowledge sharing is super important. And I think in a lot of ways, there are efforts that are attempting to recreate the wheel. And we may not always know that there are projects that are very similar to our own um, in different regions or parts of the globe um, and where we can benefit from just understanding and learning from some of those processes that are already underway. So I think providing opportunities to exchange information but then also to remove the barrier and the, uh, the challenge of communicating failures, I think is something that really needs to be done in that information exchange. Because you know, I think in most cases, we can learn probably more from our failures than successes in the sense that we really know what not to go back to. And I think um, offering opportunities where you can have various structures, scales of discussions that relate to the decision-making process and the design process um, that are focused around exchanging information and resources, building off of ideas that are already underway, but maybe not have, do not have the resources needed to move that forward. Um, I think that's something that follows along with the approach that you mentioned. Um, and it's definitely a starting point that could be applied to any number of organizations. Um, and I will say that's something that uh, we're planning on doing with the Army Corps of Engineers um, and creating uh, within the Institute for Water Resources, creating that information exchange um, to benefit from what's happening on the academic research side of things, 
um, understanding what's happening at the NGO and nonprofit level, and then using federal resources, which there are quite a few, to actually construct and to maintain projects long term. So it's a lofty goal, but something we're looking to do sh shortly. Thanks, Matt. Lucinda, where would you get the biggest bang for your buck? Uh, boy, I um, am not, um, yeah, I'm not sure that, that I have enough experience um, working on the infrastructure side of things, but um, for sure, as I work with communities, uh, the, the decision makers in communities are starved for information, but also just um, basic tools that help them identify the magnitude of problems so that they can use the um, minimum resources that they have at their disposal uh, to prioritize um, where they should be putting their dollars. Um, input from the community in various uh, ways really um, can help alleviate a lot of mistakes. And there's a lot of restoration activity occurring in the Great Lakes Basin as a result of the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Um, this is $300 million, $350 million a year now um, that is being deployed across the basin. And it turns out that many of the restorations that have, a, have been implemented um, turn out not to be so great for the um, people that are most closely affected by those restorations. That is the um, low income communities that are right along the shoreline um, have these restoration activities that uh, are planned and executed without sufficient input from those communities. And as a result, um, many of those communities end up um, basically being displaced by the very activities that are supposed to benefit them. So uh, I, I'm in agreement with Matt that making sure that the agencies are in communication, but I'd also say that um, including community members in that decision-making process um, is equally critical. Yeah. So, so the, we have about I'll, I'll just add one thing is that is um, indigenous communities and, and the um, knowledge that those communities bring to the table, along with um, citizens that are not part of those indigenous communities, um, have a lot of knowledge about the system that we ought to be capturing and, and using um, in order to uh, both assess and um, predict changes and um, plan for the, um, the adaptations that are necessary. So I, we have a couple more minutes, Lucinda. I wanna, I mean, you mixed a couple of things that are really important. So we, we've got to think through the sort of social justice side of this thing. And you mentioned that there are disenfranchised communities that sometimes don't have a voice and sometimes things that are meant to help them, in fact, hinder them more. And I, and I think that's, that's really the case, especially in really densely urban environments. And then there's that communication issue where it's some of the disenfranchised communities that have the least access to any information, the least ability to have, have significant input. Do you see a, a, a way forward? I mean, how, how, do we, how do we break that communication divide, which is basically a social justice issue in my head? Do you have a sense of that? Uh, you know, I'm not an expert in um, community engagement, but the social scientists that I work with um, are very adept at bringing together groups of individuals um, from different parts of the community to assess capacity for interacting and acting upon some of these threats. Um, there are a lot of community leaders that are available to participate in these decision-making um, and planning activities. And I, I just think that we haven't, um, to this point, 
um, really held the um, decision makers feet to the fire uh, with respect to bringing, doing the hard work to bring community members to the table when it comes to these planning uh, activities. And in some cases, the urgency is so great that it is difficult to um, engage in uh, that kind of an exercise. You know, the, these threats that you're experiencing right now in Tampa Bay are clearly emergencies, but uh, on the upstream side of emergencies is emergency planning. And in emergency planning, um, we ought to be bringing different parts of the community into those discussions so that when the emergencies do occur, there's been some sort of a, uh, a communication stream uh, that can help to inform the, both the process and um, the people, as well as the mechanisms by which those uh, communications need to occur. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And and I, I'm, I'm watching some of the chats coming through, and and people are saying, you know, there's all kinds of new community science. There are tools out there. Um, there are community-led research toolkits. There are uh, data sharing platforms. There are lots and lots of ways. Uh, one person says, you know, data is part of the of the communication issue and its power. Um, just a, we have two a couple more uh, minutes. I don't know. Some of you are able to speak. Um, does anybody want to ask? Well, we got a couple minutes for Matt and Lucinda. Anybody that's on here want to ask a question directly? I, I'm doing my best to sort of read through, but take advantage of their expertise and dedication and see anything. Uh, Todd, yeah, Todd, yes. It's Obey. Hey, Obey. Yeah, hey. I have a question for Matt and maybe Lucinda as well. You know, a lot of uh, many planning documents or standards are based on, you know, past history of data or hydrology. I'm wondering, is Army Corps or other agencies, are they developing new standard or guidelines for this develop or planning for future conditions uh, and account for that uncertainty? Yeah. Because when you invest a lot of money, you want to make sure that they are robust enough to function under future condition, not under current condition. And that should be a fundamental principle in, in planning now under climate change. Great. Yeah, thanks, Obey. So, so Lucinda talked about the great challenge of uncertainty and the change in variance and how that uh, affects us. Matt, yeah, you want to say anything on behalf of the Army Corps? We only have a couple of minutes, so just a quick response. Sure, yeah, uh, that's a great question, Obi, thank you for raising that. Um, that's definitely something Army Corps is looking to uh, create a more robust framework for implementation when it comes to addressing uncertainty. Um, I think that in regard to the modeling approaches that are currently at play, um, they're done at such a large scale that um, they're, not only if you're working within particular smaller units. So I mentioned habitat units in the past for assessing benefits or um, numbers for reduction in flood exposure, for example. Um, there's, of course, uncertainty within that unit and across units. Um, I think the biggest difficulty is that we are now in the process of switching the, um, the type of modeling that's used um, away from traditional to more um, incorporating elements of machine learning. So understanding these more potentially sophisticated statistical approaches. And I think that in doing so that there are a lot of, there's a lot of room for improvement in doing that. Uh, but it's also understanding land use legacies and how that comes into play. So how the history will benefit information um, to model for the future. So great yeah, work in progress. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Thanks. I think I think we're all hanging a lot of hope in artificial intelligence, machine learning, and being able to find patterns we haven't been able to find before, especially with these sort of nonlinearities. So, thank you, Lucinda, Matt. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your expertise. Thank you for your dedication. Um, we'll go through and look through all the questions. If there are specific questions that were aimed at you folks that I just couldn't keep with, I'll send them your way, and and perhaps we can put together some responses. Um, for the participants. But again, thank you all so much.
Um, as we transition Good now, yeah, thank you, Lucinda. Um, here's another poll question. Again, we'd love to see your answers in the chat. So the question is, in your opinion, what is the best case for science-based policies and investments to advance adaptation and nature-based projects that address the needs of our country, regardless of the region? So please, let me give you just a couple of seconds. So it seems clear that this administration is going to be interested in, in putting back together the economy and nature. And that's something we've been lacking for, a, for quite a while. So, you know, Lucinda talked about the $300 million plus project in the Great Lakes. We're, we're spending in the billions for Everglades restoration. We've got to get more sustainable ways of sort of paying for those necessary uh, green infrastructure pr programs that we all rely on. So please type in your answers. All right, it's now my uh, my pleasure to, to bring in the core uh, a, a, a kind of a different perspective, perhaps. Um, um, we're very excited to have one of our newest partners, the MITRE Corporation joining us this morning. MITRE is a federally funded research and development center. They've recently announced that they're contemplating building a hub in Miami, which is of course great, of course, great news to those of us in, uh, at Florida International University, as well as University of Miami and, and other folks around here. Lots of great opportunities for, for collaboration and, and synergism between uh, MITRE Corporation and us. So let me introduce Dr. Alex Slichting, Energy and Environmental Science Group Lead at the MITRE Corporation. And, and Alex is gonna talk about water security and resilience decision aids. Alex, thank you for being here. Thank you, of course, Todd. And, and uh, good morning to everyone. Thank you for the introduction and, and thank you for using an earlier picture where you don't see the gray hairs that my children <laughs> are causing. Um, so, so this is a very brief look. I only have a couple of minutes. Uh, so um, next slide, please. Uh, just to re to expound on what uh, Todd mentioned about MITRE, uh, we are a global not-for-profit research and development corporation. Uh, as you can see called out, there's a variety of um, impacts that we've had um, in different sectors. We are starting to tailor and focus a lot of our expertise across our 8,000 plus technical employees. Um, to understand what MITRE can do to help in the uh, climate resilient space. We were originally founded in 1958, spun off of uh, MIT Lincoln Labs, just an interesting anecdote there. Um, but we focus very much on complex systems of systems thinking and engineering and those challenges. Um, next slide, please. So along those lines, there's obviously growing recognition that everyone here has been talking about in terms of the uh, complex systems of systems nature of building resilience. Uh, you have an interdependent network, um, not only across your climate threats, but also across your critical infrastructure and your surrounding community. And so how do you make sure to, um, to the previous panelists' excellent points teed me up here, how do you make sure that everyone is aware of the best practices, the current data information, et cetera, so that you can empower these local decision makers to make more holistic assessments of the benefits and trade-offs of potential um, you know, resilience measures or investments that they can do? Um, so one example of the Department of Homeland Security, Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency transitioned in 2019 from its 16 critical infrastructure to 55 national critical functions um, as a recognition that there needs to be better planning for resilience across these traditional stovepipes. And FEMA, it, it has a, a similar analog as well. And, and that's just starting to expound um, to others. Uh, next slide, please. So what are some of MITRE's ideas for the um, opportunities to, to really bring innovative technologies to this challenge? Uh, these four columns are, are really just the standard steps for resilience planning between understanding your threats and what your vulnerabilities are, performing risk assessments, and then the really the big challenge that we've seen in the community is taking the next steps in terms of 
doing adaptation planning and then developing and tracking the measures and metrics to understand the outcomes to you know understand what your return on investment actually was to better inform the next set of investments those types of challenges so you know this this has been mentioned before but i'll briefly touch on it there there needs to be an effort to consolidate this type of information make it available and accessible to a broad array of stakeholders but then you can there's an opportunity there to leverage that to build um, upon with uh, you know decision support tools so these are you know analytics tied to specific models of infrastructure, community, human behavior, those types of aspects to really bring data and science towards these decision-making processes. And a huge challenge with this entire pipeline is uh, um, to the previous speaker's point, to, to make it accessible and intuitive and available to the local communities who have that historical intuitive knowledge of what has worked in the past and how the, the model needs to be tweaked to really be representative of the situation that they're facing. So next slide, please. So this is just a brief case study description of some of the work that we're starting. Um, so this is specifically looking at resilient water infrastructure. It's obviously very uh, relevant to the discussion here today. Um, and trying to understand what are the different um, sensors, the grids, uh, sensor grids that are necessary, as well as models of plant dynamics that can be used with that to understand um, the, the risks, not only real time, but also better in terms of planning. So um, this is something that we're, we're starting to um, get into between you know, leveraging our modelers, cyber security analysts, environmental, water quality subject matter experts, our systems engineers, um, to try and improve the resilience to not only weather events, but also other national security considerations, such as chemical and biological contaminants. Um, there's been recent examples of this in the news from a couple of months ago. Um, so, you know, that is a challenge that, that we are looking to see how technology can be brought to bear. Uh, next slide, please. And here's a couple of other um, examples as well. Um, we, we have uh, some initial efforts looking at dam resilience, uh, um, and then last is a, a supply chain resilience and economic shock planning. Um, that is in itself a very complex system of systems um, uh, uh, challenge as well that, that does have implications for, for resilient infrastructure, especially if you think utility grid and how long it takes to replace a transformer. It's a lot longer than one would like. Um, so. These are all interconnected and these are just some other examples um, that I wanted to mention. But you know, MITRE is really excited to um, start uh, and applying our expertise across our, our you know, diverse array of federal government sponsors. Um, we work with private industry and academia uh, um, to really bring um, you know, a, a diversity of expertise and collaboration to bear on these tough challenges. So thank you so much for the time and um, I'll, I'll be around for the rest of the day. Um, and, and my email is, is here on the slides if you're um, interested in uh, uh, chatting with me. So thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. We can certainly use your help down here in Tampa. What we now know is that those uh, holding ponds are not resilient. <laughs> so it's a, it's a yes, no answer. And the answer is no. So thank you so much. And folks, uh, yeah, please keep typing in the chats, more information, more questions. Um, I'm sure Alex and his team will be happy to answer those. So I think now um, we are going to show a brief video um, highlighting the wall of wind facility that we have that President Rosenberg alluded to.
Right. And you'll be hearing from Rich Olson later, who will probably I'll talk about that again. Okay, so President Biden and his administration rolled out their major infrastructure plan. It's a huge investment of resources into climate, water infrastructure, and just overall resilience um, um, from a sort of an infrastructure perspective. And again, infrastructure is physical, it's cyber, it's human. There are lots of uh, aspects of, of what we need for, for environmental resilience. We know what our challenges are in coastal areas, but in general areas of flooding damage, levee breaches, like we've been talking about in Tampa, sea level rise, aging inland waterways and ports, our whole water systems like in South Miami that are completely outdated. And the, and the fact that we continue to move people to the coastal areas, whether it be the coast of the Great Lakes or the coast of the oceans. There's no doubt that the demography shows that more and more people are migrating and building on our coastal environment. So that puts a huge squeeze on those coastal resources and what we need to think about in terms of uh, urban resilience. In 2020 alone, the United States endured 22 separate billion dollar weather and climate disasters costing $95 billion in damages to homes, businesses, and, and public infrastructure. So for this next panel, we want to focus on the infrastructure priorities. What should they be? What would a national model for innovative coastal resilience planning look like? And not, it just doesn't have to be coastal. It can be just resilience planning. So we've got a great panel. We've got three folks who know resilience and infrastructure well. Dr. Krista Capps, soon to be associate professor in the Odom School of Ecology at the University of Georgia. Andrew Huff is a senior director of federal affairs, National Association of Mutual Insurance Companies. And Dr. Rich Olson is the director of the Extreme, uh, Extreme Events Institute at Florida International University. So let me open it up to uh, the panel. Krista, I'll start with you. What are you working on? What are you thinking about when it comes to sort of infrastructure and especially when we talk about urban and built environments? Yeah, hi, Todd. Thank you so much for including me. And though I'm hoping it will end up positively, I'm still an assistant professor. So, um, <laughs> There's no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I am a freshwater ecologist and very interested in the quality and quantity of surface waters, particularly rivers and streams. And I became interested in infrastructure and then started a deep delve into thinking about infrastructure. Once I realized I was having problems modeling what might be happening in rivers and streams, particularly with on-site wastewater infrastructure. And so that's what I'm gonna talk about today. I've created a QR code that you can scan with your phones. If you'd like to go to a supplemental website I've set up on my website with some resources that might be useful for folks um, that are thinking about policy development. Next slide, please. Um, so the one thing that I think is really important is that we need to embrace the fact that everyone lives in a watershed. And so most people um, in this country and throughout the world depend on rivers and streams and groundwater resources for uh, both drinking water and then potentially the discharge of wastewater. Next slide. So what that means is that folks that are living upstream are going to, next slide, have impacts on communities downstream. And this in particular will be affecting coastal communities. The other important thing to remember is that we all need to drink and we all poop. So these things interact, they're influencing surface water quality and maybe applying a watershed or systems level approach to thinking about the management of water infrastructure could be beneficial at this time. Next slide. So the, in particular, I became interested in on-site waste systems because I was just really unaware of the um, interconnectivity of both centralized, so sewer-based, and uh, decentralized, and in most cases, septic infrastructure in the US. And you can see from this map that uh, on-site wastewater infrastructure is really important uh, to the US. And in fact, the Army Corps um, suggests that, uh, um, I'm sorry, not the Army Corps, the American Society of Civil Engineering estimates that 20% um, of all people, households in the US are dependent on septic. Next slide, please. But the thing that is really profound, and this was frustrating as a freshwater ecologist, was that jurisdictions, and most of the time this is at the local and state level, 
don't maintain accessible data pertaining to on-site waste systems. So oftentimes if records are maintained, they are on in paper form and you can't effectively do planning or risk management or mitigation with records that are stored in boxes in a dusty closet somewhere. So a lot of jurisdictions at the local level don't actually know the total number, the location, the condition, the maintenance or failure risks of their systems. Next slide. And in Georgia, just to give you an example, a state that impacts both the Atlantic coast and the Gulf Coast with our activities, um, we're producing over a billion um, gallons of wastewater that's being treated by septic systems each year. And as you can see, we're a river rich state and this is going to be impacting all of those water, uh, watersheds. Next slide, please. And so the thing about on-site waste management is it's exceptionally complex. So at the beginning, permitting and site selection and placement is actually heavily regulated, but everything else in this complex network of management um, basically ends up as, as a homeowner or a property owner uh, responsibility until there is environmental failure. So can you move to the next slide, please? So maintenance and or the lack of maintenance of these systems can lead to environmental and public health consequences. And there are a, a bunch of complexities at the local, state, and federal level, but also at the watershed level that make managing on-site waste systems really complex. And this includes, again, maintenance, the ability to treat waste that's been um, pumped from on-site waste systems, and even our penalty systems associated with um, illegally disposing of waste. Uh, next slide, please. And again, education is a really important component of this. Oftentimes when I'm speaking to people, they, they actually don't even know they are on septic systems, which has a, a lot of <laughs> important implications. Next slide, please. So I wanna um, discuss a few things that I think are really important. So first, again, records and data management are lacking, and this is especially true with maintenance. So once septic systems go in, most jurisdictions don't know if folks are actually treating them, which can lead to failure. Next slide, please. Another major important thing is that education needs um, need to be addressed. So from what I've spoken to about regional, so in the Southeast and Georgia in particular, we lack soil scientists that can actually understand whether or not a soil is appropriate for this type of placement. So education needs to come to the homeowner and through extension agents and maintenance, but it also, we need to think about this from a STEM education perspective. Next slide, please. The other thing that is that I'm finding is really alarming is that once septic systems are pumped, most places will not, wastewater treatment facilities will not take that pumped waste, which means that pumpers have a couple options. They can dump them illegally in watersheds or they can drive across state or jurisdictional lines to try to find another place, which really increases costs. So the lack of treatment options coupled with our dependence and increasing use of septic systems is exceptionally problematic and is uh, what I would say is one of the biggest resilience problems with on-site waste infrastructure. Next slide, please. And the last thing I want to highlight here is that these have really big environmental justice implications. So oftentimes penalties associated with not treating waste correctly are actually criminalized, which means people have a, a fine or they can actually serve jail time. And oftentimes in poorer communities, people may be making the decision to pay for pumping, which can cost several hundred dollars, to refitting a system, which can cost thousands of dollars, or trying to, to basically create their own system or called straight piping, which is actually putting waste back out into uh, the environment without any sort of treatment. And this has major implications. The Southeast is known for these issues. Coastal areas are in particular, um, which I'll talk about on the next slide, subject to issues with this, but the criminalization of, of this is a huge issue that could actually be addressed with more effective policy making. Then last slide, please. And lastly, I just wanna say that Todd already spoke about this, but sea level rise is compromising the ability of coastal communities to deal with septic waste. So that sea, that water that's coming up from the groundwater is shifting the water table, which means that untreated waste is entering that water table. What this also means is that 
sea level rise is going to require replacement of systems and rethinking this type of waste infrastructure and this needs to be invested in. Extreme weather events that are also coupled with environmental change are compromising tanks, but the lack of data that we have, just basic data on tank maintenance, means that we can't predict even how well-maintained tanks are going to respond to the intensification of storm events. Thank you. Thanks very much, Krista. I mean, those are exactly the same issues we're facing down here. Um, the cost is ex exorbitant, but I don't think we have a lot of choice, right? I mean, we just have to get off the of septic systems. Andrew, what do we need to know about infrastructure? All right, thank you so much, Todd. And it's been such a wonderful uh, uh, to be a part of this conversation today and to hear uh, so many diverse perspectives and you know, really all the experts on this call. Just thank you for allowing, allowing me to be a part of this. So my name is Andrew Huff, as Todd mentioned. Um, I'm a senior director of federal affairs with the National Association of Mutual Insurance Companies. Um, and back in 2011, NAMIC um, helped form what's called the Build Strong Coalition. Um, and that's a group of firefighters, architects, emergency managers, contractors, building code officials, manufacturers, you name it, um, all dedicated to finding ways to advance policies on Capitol Hill and increasingly around the country um, designed to incentivize the use of more mitigation and stronger construction and stronger building codes. And so um, gosh, back when we began this conversation, um, you know, on Capitol Hill, um, which was a year, by the way, after the opening of the IBHS Research Center um, in Chester County, South Carolina, which, by the way, the FIU facility was really impressive to see. And it's very, you know, I think kind of similar in terms of IBHS. Um, we could take those images in terms of sort of, um, you know, seeing one house side by side, one house with more weak codes and one house with stronger codes stand after a storm. So we were able to take that um, sort of video evidence to Capitol Hill for the first time and begin talking about this, um, the power of stronger building codes because, you know, way back when we like to joke that when, when we began this conversation, um, the conversation around resilience and stronger codes and more mitigation wasn't really had on Capitol Hill. Um, in fact, I can remember, you know, being in a few offices talking about the word building code and seeing, you know, sort of eyes roll back in folks' head, that sort of thing. And so um, I think, you know, the conversation has changed a lot over the, over the, over the past decade um, and sort of, you know, along the way, um, the Build Strong Coalition has been working to advance, you know, policies, like I said, designed to um, increase the use, the use of building codes and sort of, you know, in that conversation, we really began talking more and more on Capitol Hill about the fact that we saw the federal government was spending so much more on mitigation after the fact instead of before the fact. Um, and so we began, you know, testifying before Congress in terms of saying, hey, let's spend more money up front um, on investing in communities in the face of climate risk before um, that climate risk. And so that way we can, you know, better protect homes and communities after the fact as well as infrastructure. And so in that conversation, we, you know, um, uh, worked to advance a number of pieces of legislation over the years, including a piece, uh, a piece of a bill called the State Voting Code Incentive Act, a bill called the National Mitigation Investment Act, which really culminated and the Disaster Recovery Reform Act, which was enacted in 2018, as, and I think I saw somebody put in the chat um, about the BRIC program. And so Dura created what's called the BRIC program, the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program at FEMA. And so um, you know, that's going to drastically increase the amount of resources that communities can have for pre-disaster mitigation. Um, just by way of reference, um, if you look back to 2017, I think the federal government doled out 90 million through the existing pre-disaster mitigation program at the time. And then of course, this latest BRIC funding round was 500 million. And I think, you know, could really be increased even more. And so um, now the Build Strong Coalition is talking to folks on Capitol Hill about the incredible opportunity we have with, you know, with an infrastructure bill in terms of, you know, making sure that we include those policies designed to um, really allow the BRIC program to, um, to really, um, you know, almost sort of uh, even be enhanced in increasing community resilience, as well as continuing to create more incentives for the use of stronger construction and building codes. So that's sort of, you know, what we're up to now on Capitol Hill and, you know, glad to get into more detail in terms of kind of the policies that we're talking to lawmakers about. Um, but that's sort of the story of, you know, kind of NAMIC and the Build Strong Coalition and how we got here um, and, you know, the importance of obviously continuing to drive policies designed to um, increase community resilience and coastal resilience in the face of um, climate risk. Hey, thank you so much, Andrew. And we'll come back to you with a, a couple of more uh, questions. Rich, what, do you, what can you tell us about infrastructure and wind? How do we fight the big bad wolf? Okay, thanks, Todd. And good morning, everybody. Uh, as the, the wall of wind video, as you can surmise from it, our focus is really on 
extreme event impacts uh, the physical aspects of it. But I have to say, water is life, okay? There's a broader context within which we work. We may look at the built environment and the human environment, and those are our foci, but without a healthy natural environment, there is no built environment or human environment. It's the basis upon which we all proceed. So water is life, and we start with that. So I, I want to echo what Todd and others were saying earlier about our demographic shift to the coasts. Look, we move toward the water, and now the water is moving toward us. Uh, if you think about it, it's kind of like watching a slow motion demographic hazard train wreck. But that's what we've done and we have to live with it. So what you're seeing right now on the screen is the terrible perfection of Hurricane Dorian in 2019, just over the Bahamas. Um, now the Saffir Simpson scale only has five categories. I know that and that's official, but I have to tell you when I see 175 or 180 mile an hour storms sustained, to me, those are, that's cat six. I know it's not official, but for me, it's very real. And Dorian hit 185 miles an hour sustained. So my point is nature is evolving the hazards. It's a question of not just staying even with nature, um, the building codes and land use, but getting ahead of it. Climate change induces stronger storms. Next slide, please. Now, Dorian for us should be a teaching event. That, that's us right there, South Florida, immediately to the west of that storm. It made a very late turn to the north, thank God, because for a while there, it was heading straight up 8th Street in Miami. And that storm was still at 185 miles an hour just off our coast before it made the turn. It devastated islands in the Bahamas and there will never be another Dorian, but for a reason that goes, the World Meteorological Organization has retired the name Dorian because the devastation was so severe. So, to me, Dorian will always be the cat six that didn't quite hit us. But as we look at every coming season, we have to keep thinking about nature is evolving the hazard and it's a race for us. Okay, so if we think about coastal infrastructure from a strategic point of view, Resilience is really a combination of what we call the three R's. You retrofit in place, people call that strengthening. You replace with a, with a redesigned and stronger part of the infrastructure or lifelines in my experience, or you relocate. Some people call that retreat, but it's, if it's done correctly, it's a strategic relocation of infrastructure. So what's to be done? I think we have to focus on a better process to avoid a public free-for-all on resilience and resilience projects that erodes or will erode, further erode public trust in government and institutions. So for me, what we need is a nonpartisan expert resilience evaluation commission that can put some protection, political protection around policymakers and political leaders who know what the right thing is, 
but are often frightened of doing it or supporting it for fear of negative electoral outcomes in the next go around. Hmm. We, have to, we have to protect those people, folks. We have to organize to protect them. So identify coastal infrastructure at risk, use the three R approach to prioritize the targets for upgraded resilience, and then find the finance solutions at all levels, federal, state, and local, and then achieve actual implementation. I love plans, um, but plans that don't end up being physically manifested anywhere. They're just things that are nice on the shelf. Thank you, and I'm available. Thanks very much, Rich. Okay, and, and Rich brought up the point about finance, and one of the programs that Rich's group and my group are working on is sort of creating a new program in environmental finance and risk management. Quite frankly, there has always been a disconnect between our financial instruments and what we rely on in terms of our environment um, from all the perspectives we've talked about. So I, I wanna open, I, I wanna ask one more question and I wanna open it up to the audience. But Chris, I'm gonna start with you because I know you've thought a lot about this. I know you've all read the 800 plus pages of the, of the Biden infrastructure bill, um, but so what's missing? Is there one thing missing or Krista perhaps not missing, but what should be emphasized? What's the number one thing you would say, just go to page 472 and let's start there. Well, I would love some more particular details again about on-site waste infrastructure. And in particular, I think with science, we can convert this non-point source of pollution into a point source. And I think that investment can occur now. And I find that particularly exciting. Additionally, with better data about how systems function and respond to extreme events and changing climate, um, we can actually use new technologies, existing technologies to create warning systems for communities when environmental failure is going to occur and multiple, if not watershed levels of septic systems are subject to failure. And lastly, we do have existing tools, but I really do think that um, this is a chance to address some environmental justice issues if we start developing and supporting communities to identify areas that are subject to environmental justice issues surrounding on-site waste. And so that's what I would love to see, more details and more science-based work, because I think we could convert this non-point source into a better understanding or point source pollution. Oh, very cool, great. Andrew, I, I know FIU is hosting a roundtable tomorrow on sort of insurance prices and, and you know climate and all that stuff. But from your perspective, what what should the uh, what should the uh, infrastructure bill highlight? Where do you want to point? Thanks, Todd. Appreciate that. Yeah, you know, I think we were very excited to see the infrastructure plan. And forgive me, I don't know the exact page number. Um, talking about, I think spending two hundred thirteen billion to retrofit a ton of affordable homes, and that was you know really exciting. I think. Um, you know, in terms of the infrastructure plan, there's still additional opportunities, um, and we're talking to Congress about that in terms of ways to um, increase state and local capacity to, to undertake risk-reducing mitigation actions by increasing the capacity of the BRIC program. And we think a few ways to do that. Um, one would be to kind of increase the funding calculation for the BRIC program. Um, as you all probably know, the BRIC program can currently be funded with up to 6% of whatever was spent out of the disaster relief fund for that fiscal year. And so we're looking to maybe increase that percentage um, as well as tie a, per a certain percentage of BRIC funds to building code adoption and enforcement. Um, we know so many communities um, you know, lack the resources to have adequate building code enforcement regimes. And um, I can get into a little bit more of it later, but I think you know, the, the retrofitting piece is gonna be really important too. Um, and just looking at ways and we encourage you know, the administration and Congress to look for ways in the infrastructure bill um, to you know, try to find ways to utilize brick funding, existing brick funding um, you know, to fund retrofitting programs and incentives for folks to undertake retrofits. I mean, of course, the focus on community resilience um, obviously dovetails with the incredible you know, importance of focusing on that infrastructure resilience. And we were very you know, pleased to see some of the proposals in the plan in terms of you know, hardening infrastructure in the face of a number of different types of catastrophes um, and I think, you know, obviously the, the sort of interconnectedness between home resilience and infrastructure resilience all kind of comes together to make commun uh, communities more resilient. And so, you know, those are some of the things that we'd like to see in an infrastructure bill, um, I think, um, you know, to add on to what's already there. Thanks. Great. Thanks. 
Rich, you gave us some pretty specifics at the end, but is there one single thing you would highlight? One thing you would say, we've got to do this now? Yeah, and, and I'm the political guy, okay? The, I look at all of these things and I say to myself, where's the politics in this? And in particular, how is there a chance? What is the possibility of protecting and promoting the reemergence of a political center in the United States where you have political leaders who know what the right thing is, but they're afraid to do it for fear of retaliation. And what we need is we need a collateral document that says we're going to give credit to, to political leaders that will join us in this resilience plan so that they get recognition that might help protect them in the future. I, I'm very worried that it's gonna end up looking like a pork barrel grab or a bunch of unaddressed Christmas presents under the tree and there's gonna be a scramble for it. Yeah. I look at it from a political point of view and that's what I see missing in that document, necessarily so but we need a collateral document that talks about how you rebuild the center. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> certainly not a lot of hopeful indications right now that we can build that sort of coalition, but who knows? I mean, let's, let, let's hope we get to move forward. All right, um, I, I wanna take advantage of this great panel uh, we have. So I wanna open it up to the audience. And I, I do want to point out that Krista has put up a couple of websites for folks to go to and look at more information. So it looks like Carrie McDougal, you've got a question. So Carrie's a co-leader of NOAA's Environmental Literacy Program. So Carrie, if you want to, we've been talking about literacy, communication and stuff. If you want to say a few words about your program and then ask away. Sure, thanks, Todd. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Great. Um, really appreciate this uh, convening. It's been um, really wonderful to hear so many uh, of the panelists and uh, attendees commenting on the importance of public engagement, which is what we focus on in NOAA's Office of Education. Um, to give you just a bit of background, I co-manage NOAA's Environmental Literacy Program, which is one of NOAA's major education competitive grants programs. And we've been in the business since 2005. In 2015, we began focusing our uh, investments on community resilience education in response to what we were hearing from the education community. The goal of these investments is to build environmental literacy of children, youth, and adults so they are knowledgeable about the ways in which their community can become more resilient to extreme weather, climate change, and other environmental hazards and become involved in achieving that resilience. These new approaches are solutions-oriented, locally focused, and engage, educate, and empower children, youth, and adults, participants to take action individually and collectively. When we first started offering these grants, we received the most uh, demand we've ever received to our um, competitions in the past. We've um, run four competitions so far and have received requests totaling $325 million. Uh, there's clearly great need for this type of work uh, throughout the country. Last year, we published a theory of change that provides a conceptual framework for the ways in which community resilience education can lead to increased community engagement and civic action, ultimately leading to a healthier, more resilient and equitable society. So earlier this morning, we heard the FIU president emphasize the need for better engagement and it's been echoed throughout um, the discussion we've heard this morning. Um, and uh, as Rich mentioned, there's uh, always a political lens. And I believe that one way to address the politics is to build public support for these issues. And, and that can be done through uh, very robust and continuous public engagement efforts. So although we know that it's important to do public engagement around community resilience, what we have found is that very few climate action or resilience plans um, include that as a strategy. And most often local governments uh, do not have sufficient resources to support community engagement efforts. We continue to insufficiently engage with community members and tap into their knowledge of their neighborhoods and solutions that they can offer and help implement. 
How can we shift the culture so that creating an educated and engaged populace is seen as a critical component in building resilience? Thank you. So that so do you have a question for any one person or just open it up? I, I it's it's open to uh, each each of the panels. Okay, uh, Rich, you want to take the first shot? Yeah, I would actually, and it 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 touches on the issue of public trust. Um, what we're seeing in so many places in so many policy domains is the public, not the general public, not the elite public, but the general public saying, well, we just don't think anybody cares about us, uh, that we're not, we're not a priority, nobody cares about a neighborhood like mine or a socioeconomic group like mine. And so I think that in response, this issue of public education has to be focused on rebuilding or creating public trust, not only in science, but in the entire system that is supposed to carry out these resilience projects. The worst case scenario is we talk it, but we don't walk it in the next few years on building resilience. How in hell are we ever going to get public trust if that happens? Over. <laughs> okay. And Andrew, any, anything to add? Thanks, Todd. Yeah, I mean, I think um, that was a great question and a great comment. I think, you know, I would agree that that education piece is so important, that public education piece. And I think, you know, one of the things that Build Strong Coalition has done in terms of sort of that amplification that you mentioned the importance of and, you know, kind of getting out our message in the public sphere sort of, you know, in tandem while we're talking to folks on Capitol Hill, you know, whether it's a sort of, you know, overarching media campaign or something designed to amplify what we're talking about, you know, we agree that's so incredibly important. Um, in terms of getting that word out. And like I mentioned, I think, you know, really just kind of, you know, trying to change the conversation, you know, on Capitol Hill, like we've been trying to do over the past decade where folks, you know, weren't even really interested in, in, in the topic of resilience. And now it's one of the biggest buzzwords on Capitol Hill. So I think that's been great to see that change. Um, but I guess that's what I would add on that. Great. Krista, you spend a lot of time engaging people in all levels of education. Anything more to add? Yes. So regarding on-site waste, there are two kind of branches that you need to address with this. One, the people who already know what they're doing and have enough resources to manage their, um, their system, we just actually need better science data to, to inform them, to tell them how, how things should work and what to expect. And so NOAA and other educational organizations might be able to partner with places like the EPA or NSF or other things like that to actually integrate this community engagement with data collection because in order to collect data on on-site waste systems we have to be on people's individual private property so that is a, a natural <laughs> kind of collaboration that would be really helpful to think about from a larger scale with multiple funding agencies but secondly the most important thing and i think this is really critical is that if people are really poor and they cannot pay rent or they have to decide between buying food and dealing with wastewater, they are probably going to pay rent and, and buy food. And so education, if we're educating people about doing something and they can't afford to do anything about it, that's problematic. So again, this is a collaborative effort where we need to think about this holistically and say, yes, let's dovetail education with resources or policy shifts to support people in maintaining their own systems. Great, thanks. I know, I know one thing we're doing at, at FIU is, again, a lot of the neighborhoods where they're on septic and the septic systems are old and leaky, we're building these water quality kits and we're giving them to the students and saying, you know, next time you get a big flood in your front yard, uh, a big rain in your front yard floods, please go take this water sample, filter it, do this, do this, bring it back and let's talk about what's in your front yard. And so what we're trying to do is sort of get people to say, aha, oh yeah, oh no, my house is one of the issues and, and try to bring it to the individual home level. And, and again, to, to cross those sort of divides of folks that don't live on the bay versus people who do live on the bay. So um, it looks like I have one more question. We've got about five minutes. Nadia Cedarum is one of our FIU fly-in students. Nadia? I don't hear you. I see oh. you. 
Oh, Hello? there you are. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so thank you, Todd. Um, so my question to the panel um, is something that we've kind of touched upon um, uh, already throughout the session. Um, but the question is, when we think about building resilient communities, we almost immediately have to reframe the question from what is resilience to resilience for who? And climate change presents challenges of non-linearities over time. So how do we ensure that we are making communities resilient with respect to their specific and current needs and even anticipate future needs within a changing climate? Uh, let's see, let's start with Andrew this time. <laughs> That's a, a great question, Nadia. And I think, you know, the way I think about that, one of the really, you know, I think sort of critical things we have to do is look at the existing housing stock, especially in terms of, you know, trying to anticipate those future climate impacts. Um, and there's so many, you know, th th there's so much existing housing stock that can be improved through, you know, the undertaking of retrofits. Um, and so it's not just new construction. So we feel like, you know, that's a critical way to sort of, you know, to really get communities and infrastructure and homes prepared um, for that changing climate impact is to, you know, really undertake retrofits and try to create incentives um, and try to create, you know, new funding streams, whether it's through the BRIC program or other funding streams to give homeowners um, and communities um, and residents tools to undertake those retrofits. Great, Krista. Thank you. Well, I would say what we actually need to do is support local communities to assess what their infrastructure looks like at this point and what the conditions are. Because again, with this type of work, um, and if you look at the national level, most people can't tell you what's going on with their wastewater infrastructure from a holistic perspective. And so what we need to do is invest so we can actually figure out how big the problem is. Rich. Yeah, that's a great question. That's why I'm so grateful you let the others go first. Um, <laughs> look, the I want to focus for just a minute on housing as part of life infrastructure. In Florida, this people don't appreciate that 60 to 70 percent of the housing stock is still pre-Andrew. 1994-ish. Andrew was 1992. New code kicks in in 94. But more than half of the housing stock in Florida is still working off the codes of the 70s and 80s. So the solution is let's look at our most vulnerable parts of the population, our most vulnerable groups, neighborhoods, and communities so that maybe we can feel better about ourselves in 10 years that we at least try to take care of the people that are most at risk. I, I would sleep better <laughs> if I thought we were doing something about the people that take it basically in every disaster. Over, thank you. Great. Rich, Andrew, Krista, thank you so much for your thoughtfulness, your dedication your input. Again, we'll look at questions and I'll shoot them your way if we've got specific questions for you folks. Nadia, I don't know if you're still on, but I understand that you guys are sort of wrapping up your, uh, your, your fly, so-called fly-in, and you're, you're, you've got a hackathon tomorrow in which you're going to focus on policy challenges that we've been talking about. I mean, we, we've got about one minute. If, if you're still there, can you tell us a little bit about what that activity looks like? What are you going to be doing? Yeah, um, I'm not... Oh. Hello? There you are. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I'm not completely sure what the activity look like, looks like, but from what I've heard and I'm really excited about, um, we're going to be um, proposing our own policy solutions based on the meetings that we've been having uh, for the past day, uh, from the meetings that we'll be having tomorrow. Um, and um, they will be packaged up and, uh, and shipped off to someone, um, I think, in one of the, um, to, to someone on Capitol Hill. Great. Well, you know, you've inherited a tough set of problems. So <laughs> I'm glad you're gonna figure out the solutions and move forward. All right, um, we have one last question. Again, please folks, um, enter your issues or your answers in the uh, chat box. The question pop up, please. Uh, what one or two solutions for coastal resilience and disaster mitigation do you think Congress and the federal government should spur along this year? 
and our panelists have given us a lot to think about. And there's certainly a lot of, of things, but, but let's, let's have Congress focus. And Nadia mentioned the event tomorrow. Again, there's a, a roundtable discussion on uh, our environmental finance and risk management program, and specifically aimed at thinking about insurance um, premiums and and how those get set and whether they're the right. <clears throat> we're using the right mechanisms. So I'm watching watching folks type. We're doing great on time. Give you a couple more seconds. All right, so let's wrap this up. Um, panelists, again, thank you, thank you so much. Great, great discussions. I know it's the time is short. You get a, you got a lot of really great information in. We're in an exciting time. We've got lots of things in front of us. Uh, from a recent poll across the United States, um, bipartisan across the, uh, uh, a, a wide ranging demography, 79% of us want the government to fix our roads, bridges, railroads, and ports. 71% of us want the government to make sure we all have high speed internet. 68% of us want the government to replace our lead pipes. And the same percentage as people who want the government to support renewable energy with tax credits. And I've been watching some of you say tax credits in some of your answers. It's great to see a current administration who's listening. It's, but more importantly, we wanna see an administration that acts and acts in a thoughtful way, a meaningful way. And I think we have that opportunity. What we do here today is, uh, uh, again, we're gonna to pull together the answers, the comments, we're going to write a synopsis document. We'll ask for further input from all of you. And then our government relations folks will get this information out to the, to the people who listen and, and think about how we're going to move forward. I thank you all an awfully lot, especially the panelists and especially the FIU DC office folks for putting this together. Um, and I look forward to continued conversation and I can't wait to sort of read through all the things that I couldn't keep up with uh, as you were typing and, and I was talking. Thank you all, have a wonderful day. Thank you. At FIU, we uh, learned the challenges of our time. By great job, thank you. Investments into results that make an impact. Thank you. Our country's scientific and policy leaders know FIU's breakthroughs are transforming Miami and the world. Our teachers inspire America's future scientists and engineers and use our tools to realize the full potential of our children and families. The country counts on us to monitor the health of the Everglades and Biscayne Bay and ensure America's coastal communities are resilient and safe from disasters. But we mobilize on our own when Florida's treasures are threatened. The Pentagon invests in us for future generation antennas and secure communications. And our engineers are restoring sensation and quality of life to those who have lost limbs, like our returning veterans. As we seek to reduce preventable disease and disorders of the brain, our scientists are leading dialogue and action. An investment in FIU is an investment in real solutions. Leaders in Tallahassee and Washington are recognizing that we drive policy. We are as real as it gets. And what real does makes a real impact.